The November Uprising 1830 also known as the Polish-Russian War 1830–31 or the Cadet Revolution, was an armed rebellion in the heartland of partitioned Poland against the Russian Empire. The uprising began on 29 November 1830 in Warsaw when the young Polish officers from the local army of the Congress Poland's Military Academy revolted, led by Lt. Peter Wysotsky. They were soon joined by large segments of societies of Lithuania, Belarus, and the right bank Ukraine. Despite local successes, the uprising was eventually crushed by a numerically superior Imperial Russian army under Ivan Paskovich. Tsar Nicholas I decreed that henceforth Poland was an integral part of Russia, with Warsaw little more than a military garrison, its university closed. Poland before the uprising After the partitions of Poland, Poland ceased to exist as an independent political entity at the end of 1795. However, the Napoleonic Wars and Polish participation in the wars against Russia and Austria resulted in the creation of the Duchy of Warsaw in 1807. The Congress of Vienna brought that state's existence to an end in 1815, and essentially solidified the long-term division of Poland among Russia, Prussia and the Habsburg Empire. The Austrian Empire annexed territories in the south, Prussia took control over the semi-autonomous Grand Duchy of Poznan in the west, and Russia assumed hegemony over the semi-autonomous so-called Congress Kingdom. Initially, the Russian-formed Congress Kingdom enjoyed a relatively large amount of internal autonomy and was only indirectly subject to imperial control, having its own constitution of the Kingdom of Poland. United with Russia through a personal union with the Tsar as King of Poland, the province could elect its own parliament the same and government. The kingdom had its own courts, army and treasury. Over time, however, the freedoms granted to the kingdom were gradually taken back and the constitution was progressively ignored by the Russian authorities. Alexander I of Russia never formally crowned himself as King of Poland. Instead, in 1815, he appointed Grand Duke Konstantin Pavlovich as de facto viceroy, disregarding the constitution. Soon after the Congress of Vienna resolutions were signed, Russia ceased to respect them. In 1819 Alexander I abandoned liberty of the press in Congress Kingdom and introduced censorship. Russian secret police commanded by Nikolai Nikolaevich Novosiltsev started infiltration and persecution of Polish clandestine organizations, and in 1821 the Tsar ordered the abolition of Freemasonry. As a result, after 1825 sessions of Polish Sejm were conducted in secret. Nicholas I of Russia formally crowned himself as King of Poland on 24 May 1829 in Warsaw. Despite numerous protests by various Polish politicians who actively supported the personal union, Grand Duke Konstantin had no intention of respecting the Polish constitution, one of the most progressive in Europe at that time. He abolished Polish social and patriotic organizations, the liberal opposition of the Kalizani faction, and replaced Poles with Russians in important administrative positions. Although married to a Pole, Joanna Grzynska, he was commonly considered as an enemy of the Polish nation. Also, his command over the Polish army led to serious conflicts within the officer corps. These frictions led to various conspiracies throughout the country, most notably within the army. Outbreak The armed struggle began when a group of conspirators led by a young cadet from the Warsaw Offices School, Peter Wysotsky, took arms from their garrison on 29 November 1830 and attacked the Bellwieder Palace, the main seat of the Grand Duke. The final spark that ignited Warsaw was a Russian plan to use the Polish army to suppress France's July Revolution and the Belgian Revolution, in clear violation of the Polish constitution. The rebels managed to enter the Bellwieder, but Grand Duke Constantine had escaped in women's clothing. The rebels then turned to the main city arsenal, capturing it after a brief struggle. The following day, armed Polish civilians forced the Russian troops to withdraw north of Warsaw. This incident is sometimes called the Warsaw Uprising or the November Night, Polish, NOC Listopadoa. Uprising. 
Taken by surprise by the rapid unfolding of events during the night of 29 November, the local Polish government administrative council assembled immediately to take control and to decide on a course of action. Unpopular ministers were removed and men like Prince Adam Jerzy Zartorski, the historian Julian Ursyn Niemcewicz and General Józef Klopitski took their places. Loyalists led by Prince Zartorski initially tried to negotiate with Grand Duke Constantine and to settle matters peacefully. However, when Zartorski told the council that Constantine was ready to forgive the offenders and that the matter would be amicably settled, Maurice Machnatsky and other radicals angrily objected and demanded a national uprising. Fearing an immediate break with Russia, the government agreed to let Constantine depart with his troops. Machnatsky didn't trust the newly constituted ministry and set out to replace it with the Patriotic Club, organized by him. At a large public demonstration on 3 December in Warsaw, he denounced the negotiations between the government and Grand Duke Constantine, who was encamped outside the city. Machnatsky advocated a military campaign in Lithuania so as to spare the country the devastation of war and preserve the local food supply. The meeting adopted a number of demands to be communicated to the administrative council, including the establishment of a revolutionary government and an immediate attack upon the forces of Constantine. The Polish army, with all but two of its generals, Winston T. Krasinski and Zygmunt Kurnatowski, now joined the uprising. The remaining four ministers of the pre-revolutionary cabinet left the administrative council, and their places were taken by Machnatsky and three of his associates from the Patriotic Club, including Joachim Lelowell. The new body was known as the Provisional Government. To legalize its actions the Provisional Government ordered the convocation of the same and on 5 December 1830 proclaimed Klopitsky as dictator of the uprising. Klopitsky considered the uprising an act of madness, but bowed to pressure and consented to take command temporarily, in the hope that it would be unnecessary to take the field. An able and highly decorated soldier, he had retired from the army because of the chicanery of Constantine. He overestimated the power of Russia and underestimated the strength and fervor of the Polish revolutionary movement. By temperament and conviction he was opposed to a war with Russia, not believing in a successful outcome. He accepted the dictatorship essentially in order to maintain internal peace and to save the constitution. Believing that Tsar Nicholas was unaware of his brother's actions and that the uprising could be ended if the Russian authorities accepted the constitution, Klopiki's first move was to send Prince Franciszek Ksa Wery Drucki Lubecki to St. Petersburg to negotiate. Klopitsky refrained from strengthening the Polish army and refused to initiate armed hostilities by expelling Russian forces from Lithuania. However, the radicals in Warsaw pressed for war and the complete liberation of Poland. On 13 December, the same pronounced the national uprising against Russia, and on 7 January 1831 Prince Drucki Lubecki returned from Russia with no concessions. The Tsar demanded the complete and unconditional surrender of Poland and announced that the Poles should surrender to the grace of their emperor. His plans foiled, Klopitsky resigned the following day. Power in Poland was now in the hands of the radicals united in the Towarzystwo Patriotians Patriotic Society directed by Joachim Lelowell. On 25 January 1831, the same passed the Act of Dethronization of Nicholas I, which ended the Polish-Russian personal union and was equivalent to a declaration of war on Russia. The proclamation declared that the Polish nation is an independent people and has a right to offer the Polish crown to him whom it may consider worthy, from whom it might with certainty expect faith to his oath and wholehearted respect to the sworn guarantees of civic freedom. On 29 January, the national government of Adam Jerzy Zartorski was established, and Michal Gedeon Radziwiłł was chosen as successor to Klopitsky. Klopitsky was persuaded to accept active command of the army. Russo-Polish War It was too late to move the theater of hostilities to Lithuania. On 4 February, a 115,000-strong Russian army under Field Marshal Hans Karl von Dybich crossed the Polish borders. The first major battle took place on 14 February 1831, close to the village of Staczek near Lukow. In the Battle of Staczek, Polish cavalry under Brigadier Józef Dwornicki defeated the Russian division of Teodor Gezmer. However, the victory had mostly psychological value and could not stop the Russian advance towards Warsaw. 
The subsequent battles of Dobre, War and Bialaleka were inconclusive, the Polish forces then assembled on the right bank of the Vistula to defend the capital. On 25 February, a Polish contingent of approximately 40,000 met a Russian force of 60,000 east of Warsaw, in the Battle of Olzinka Grahowska. Both armies withdrew after almost two days of heavy fighting and with considerable losses on both sides. Over 7,000 Poles fell on that field, and the number of killed in the Russian army was slightly larger. Dybich was forced to retreat to Siedlce and Warsaw was saved. Klopitsky, whose soldierly qualities reasserted themselves by military activity, was wounded in action and his place taken by General Jan Skrzynetsky who, like his predecessor, had won distinction under Napoleon for personal courage. Disliked by Grand Duke Constantine, he had retired from service. He shared with Klopitsky the conviction that war with Russia was futile, but with the opening of hostilities took command of a corps and fought creditably at Grachov. When the weak and indecisive Mihal Radjivil surrendered the dictatorship, Skrzynetsky was chosen to succeed him. He endeavored to end the war by negotiations with the Russian field commanders and hoped for benign foreign intervention. Sympathetic echoes of the Polish aspirations reverberated throughout Europe. Enthusiastic meetings had been held in Paris under Lafayette's chairmanship, and money for the Polish cause was collected in the United States. The governments of France and Britain, however, did not share the feelings of some of their people. King Louis-Philippe of France thought mainly of securing for himself recognition on the part of all European governments, and Lord Palmerston was intent on maintaining friendly relations with Russia. England regarded with alarm the reawakening of the French national spirit and did not wish to weaken Russia, as Europe might soon again require her services in the cause of order, and to prevent Poland, whom it regarded as a national ally of France, from becoming a French province of the Vistula. Austria and Prussia adopted a position of benevolent neutrality towards Russia. They closed the Polish frontiers and prevented the transportation of munitions of war or supplies of any kind. Under these circumstances the war with Russia began to take on a somber and disquieting aspect. The Poles fought desperately and attempts were made to rouse Volhynia, Podolia, Samogitia and Lithuania. With the exception of the Lithuanian uprising, in which the youthful Countess Emilia Plater and several other women distinguished themselves, the guerrilla warfare carried on in the frontier provinces was of minor importance and served only to give Russia an opportunity to crush local risings. Notorious was the slaughter of the inhabitants of the small town of Ashmiany in Belarus. Meanwhile, new Russian forces under Grand Duke Michael Pavlovich of Russia arrived in Poland but met with many defeats. Constant warfare, however, and bloody battles such as that at Ostrolecka in which 8,000 Poles lost their lives, considerably depleted the Polish forces. Mistakes on the part of the commanders, constant changes and numerous resignations, and the inactivity of the commanders, who continued to hope for foreign intervention, added to the feeling of despair. The more radical elements severely criticized the government not only for its inactivity, but also for its lack of land reform and its failure to recognize the peasants' rights to the soil they tilled, but the same, fearing that the governments of Europe might regard the war with Russia as social revolution, procrastinated and haggled over concessions. The initial enthusiasm of the peasantry waned, and the ineptitude of the government became more apparent. In the meantime, the Russian forces, commanded after the death of Dybich by General Paskovich, were moving to encircle Warsaw. Skrzynetsky failed to prevent the Russian forces from joining, and the same responded to popular clamor for his deposition by appointing General Dombinsky to temporary command. The atmosphere was highly charged. Severe rioting took place and the government became completely disorganized. Count Jan Krakowiecki was made president of the ruling council. He had little faith in the success of the military campaign, but believed that when passions had subsided he could end the war on, what seemed to him, advantageous terms. Despite desperate defense by General Jozef Sowinski, Warsaw's suburb of Wola fell to Paskovich's forces on 6 September. The next day saw the second line of the capital's defensive works attacked by the Russians. During the night of 7 September Krakowiecki capitulated, although the city still held out. He was immediately deposed by the Polish government and replaced by Bonawentura Nemojowski. The army and the government withdrew to the Modlin fortress, on the Vistula, subsequently renamed Novo Georgiesk by the Russians, and then to Plok. New plans had been adopted when the news arrived that the Polish crack corps under Ramarino, unable to join the main army, had laid down its arms after crossing the Austrian frontier into Galicia. 
It became evident that the war could be carried on no longer. On the 5th of October 1831, the remainder of the Polish army of over 20,000 men crossed the Prussian frontier and laid down their arms at Brodnica in preference to submission to Russia. Only one man, a colonel by the name of Stryjensky, gained the peculiar distinction of giving himself up to Russia. Following the example of Dabrowski of a generation before, General Bem endeavoured to reorganise the Polish soldiers in Prussia and Galicia into legions and lead them to France, but the Prussian government frustrated his plans. The immigrants left Prussia in bands of between 50 and 100, and their journey through the various German principalities was greeted with enthusiasm by the local populations. Even German sovereigns such as the King of Saxony, the Princess of Weimar and the Duke of Gotha shared in the general demonstration of sympathy. It was only upon the very insistent demands of Russia that the Polish committees all over Germany had to be closed. Postscript Adam Zartoryski remarked that the war with Russia, precipitated by the rising of young patriots in November 1830, came either too early or too late. Puzitrevsky argued, that the rising should have been initiated in 1828 when Russia was experiencing reverses in Turkey and was least able to spare substantial forces for war with Poland Lewinsky -Korwin, 1917. Military critics, among them Russian pundit, General Puzitrevsky, maintained that in spite of the inequality of resources of the two countries, Poland had had every chance of holding her own against Russia, had the campaign been managed skillfully. Russia sent over 180,000 well-trained men against Poland 70,000, 30% of whom were fresh recruits who entered the service at the opening of hostilities. In view of this, one would think that not only was the result of the struggle undoubted, but its course should have been a triumphant march for the infinitely stronger party. Instead, the war lasted eight months, with often doubtful success. At times the balance seemed to tip decidedly to the side of the weaker adversary who dealt not only blows, but even ventured daring offensives. It had long been argued wrote Edward Lewinsky Corwin in 1917 that anarchy and a lack of concord among people were the causes of Poland's national downfall. Thus, when the rising finally began, the insurgents demanded absolute power for their leaders and tolerated no criticism, afraid that discord would again prove ruinous for all. However, the men chosen to lead, because of their past achievements, proved unable to perform the great task expected of them. Moreover, many apparently had little faith that their joint effort could succeed. Militarily, Poland might have succeeded if the line of battle had been established in Lithuania, wrote Lewinsky Korwin, and if the Russian forces arriving in Poland progressively had been dealt with separately and decisively, one unit after another. After the end of the November uprising, Polish women wore black ribbons and jewelry as a symbol of mourning for their lost homeland. Such images can be seen in the first scenes of the movie Pan Tadeusz, filmed by Andrzej Wajda in 1999, based on the Polish national epic. A 1937 German film Ride to Freedom was partly shot on location in Poland. The Scottish poet Thomas Campbell, who had championed the cause of the Poles in The Pleasures of Hope, was affected by the news of the capture of Warsaw by the Russians in 1831 as if it had been the deepest of personal calamities. Poland preys on my heart night and day. He wrote in one of his letters, and his sympathy found a practical expression in the foundation in London of the Association of the Friends of Poland. The November Uprising was also supported in the United States. Edgar Allan Poe was sympathetic to the Polish cause and volunteered to fight the Russians during the November Uprising B.O.B.R. Tylingo 1982, 145. Despite Poland's deep connection to Catholicism and the fact that many participants in the rebellion were Catholic, the rebellion was condemned by the Church. Pope Gregory XVI issued an encyclical in the following year of 1832 on the subject of civil disobedience that was entitled Cum Primum, and which stated, when the first report of the calamities, which so seriously devastated your flourishing kingdom reached our ears, we learned simultaneously that they had been caused by some fabricators of deceit and lies. Under the pretext of religion, and revolting against the legitimate authority of the princes, they filled their fatherland, which they loosed from due obedience to authority, with mourning. We shed abundant tears at the feet of God, grieving over the harsh evil with which some of our flock was afflicted. Afterward we humbly prayed that God would enable your provinces, agitated by so many and so serious dissensions, to be restored to peace and to the rule of legitimate authority.
Topic See also Great Emigration List of wars involving Poland Varsavianka 1831 Roku Revolutionary Etude Hotel Lambert Polish National Government November Uprising Sources in Polish Amelia Plater Stanislas Hernisch equals equals notes <laughs>